Good morning, everyone. Um, uh, I'm very excited for the day's lineup, and so I'm proud to present to you our uh, newest faculty member, Kwang Hoon Chung. <laughs> uh, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Can you guys hear me okay? So it's an honor to be a part of this exciting uh, symposium, and today I'd like to introduce a couple of tools that uh, we've been developing for high throughput multi-dimensional uh, integration of the brain. So a key goal in neuroscience is to understand how phenotypic variation is produced through interactions between uh, genotype and environment. And to study this interaction, we need detailed phenotypic data. But our ability to characterize the, this phenomic information lags way behind our ability to uh, characterize genome, uh, genomic information especially a uh, measurement of system-wide phenotype uh, information such as long-range brain-wide connectivity is particularly challenging. So to address this issue, my lab has been developing high-throughput, high-dimensional phenotypic technologies, and today I'd like to introduce a couple of them, uh, starting with Clarity. So Clarity is a technology that I developed in the Dicell's lab before I joined MIT. And it is a technology that transforms uh, intact tissue into optically transparent and macromolecule permeable form while preserving all the structural and molecular information. And once a brain becomes this transparent, we can image the brain without mechanical sectioning and visualize the distribu distribution of neurons and their uh, connectivity in intact tissue. So this is a uh, mouse brain expressing fluorescent proteins in subset of projecting neurons, and we, I imaged uh, ventral half of the mouse brain, and you can see uh, the cortical neurons, their projections, distinct uh, brain structures, and distribution of uh, these EYP expressing neurons. And this is uh, brainstem, probably the most scattering region of the brain because of high, uh, high degree of myelination, but still we were able to uh, make it completely transparent and visualize neurons and projections in this brain region as well. So because this technique doesn't require uh, same mechanical section and 3D reconstruction, uh, after imaging is done, you can immediately uh, get this 3D perspective. Another great advantage uh, of this technique is you can use molecular probes to uh, visualize the distribution of uh, target molecules because the tissue is macromolecule permeable. Uh, so here, this is mouse brain hippocampus expressing uh, fluorescent proteins in subset of neurons. And here we used uh, parvalvumin antibody and GFAB antibody to visualize these neurons. Uh, parvalvumin is red and GFAB is green. So we can get uh, both structural and molecular information from the same tissue in a high throughput manner. So the key step in clarity is to make hydrogel tissue hybrid. And to make hydrogel tissue, uh, hydrogel tissue hybrid and replace lipids uh, from the, extract lipids from the tissue to uh, remove the scattering uh, layer and also the diffusion barrier. So to achieve that, we first infuse uh, hydrogel monomer building block a hydrogel building blocks such as a hydrogen monomer shown here and formaldehyde and the thermal initiator. And in this step, these small chemicals rapidly diffuse throughout the tissue and uh, react with endogenous biomolecules. So after this step, what you have is uh, endogenous biomolecule conjugated hydrogen monomers. And in this step, this thermal initiator is not active. And after this process, we increase the temperature to uh, activate this thermal initiator, and now this thermal initiator uh, links this hydrogel, uh, the endogenous biomolecule conjugated hydrogen monomers into a nanoporous dense hydrogen mesh. So after this process, what we have is this dense nanoporous hydrogen mesh physically supporting the structure and also uh, chemically tether all the uh, endogenous biomolecules at their physiological location. And after that, uh, we use uh, electroporesis to uh, drive these highly charged SDS detergent micelles through the tissue to effectively uh, remove lipids uh, from the tissue. And because these, uh, after this step, uh, because these 
uh, biomolecules are chemically tethered uh, at their uh, physiological location uh, to the hydrogen mesh, we can preserve uh, these biomolecules very effectively. So to characterize the loss of biomolecules, we measured protein loss in clearly processed tissue, and it was only 8% uh, when uh, the, all the biomolecules are preserved by hydrogen mesh. Whereas if you don't have hydrogen mesh, after removing all the lipid bilayers, you lose over 70% uh, percent of biomolecules. And this technique is also applicable to post-mortem human tissue. So here uh, we obtained prefrontal lobe tissue from an artistic patient, and we uh, labeled 500 micron thin tissue uh, using pyrovalvin antibody. Here, this movie shows pyrovalvin positive neurons and their projections. And because we preserve the continuity of this neuron and the resolution is high enough, we were able to reconstruct these individual pyrovalvin positive neurons and uh, uh, analyze the detailed morphology of these neurons. So, uh, the cur current clear te technology is um, good enough to process and analyze mouse brain sized tissue, but it has uh, many challenges that we have to overcome to make it really scalable for mapping, uh, to use it for mapping human brain. And one of the challenge is molecular labeling. So to label uh, tissue the target molecules inside a large-scale tissue, we have to first transport uh, molecule probes deep into the tissue. And in conventional histology, when you have intact membrane, it takes over a day to transport uh, molecule probes like antibody into 40, 40 micron uh, thick tissue. And if you do uh, simple theoretical calculation, we can estimate that it would take over 100 years to transport antibodies into mouse brain sized tissue. Now in clarity, we remove these lipid bilayers to uh, significantly enhance the transport, and we can now transport uh, the same antibodies into mouse brain sized tissue uh, within many months, but still it's prohibitively slow. So one way of speeding up this transport is to tune the uh, hydrogel structure uh, by uh, tweaking these, uh, the, 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 the amount of these hydrogel building blocks. So these are the hydrogel building blocks from aldehyde and hydrogen monomers and initiators. And if you use all these molecules, uh, then you lose over 10% uh, of proteins. And you can actually uh, get rid of this bisacramide cross-linker to make tissue more permeable, um, but then you ine inevitably lose more proteins. And also you can remove a form aldehyde during the hydrogel embedding step, then, uh, then the cross-linking degree is decreased and the pore size will become larger and uh, antibodies can uh, more efficiently penetrate into the tissue, but you uh, lose more um, proteins. And also, you can decrease the amount of uh, the acrylamide, but then you will lose more proteins. So uh, other than sacrificing structural and molecular information, uh, we decided to keep our gel uh, rigid and dense, but developed a new technology, new transport technology to tra enhanced transport of charged molecules in dense and uh, rigid hydrogel. So the technology that we developed, we termed stochastic electrotransport. Basically, it's a way of uh, generating electroparticle driven random mode of charged molecules and to, to uh, speed up the movement of molecules inside the tissue. And we can actually transport um, antibodies by several orders of magnitude faster than passive diffusion. So using this technique, we were able to uh, shorten the transport time scale from many months to hours in mouse brain sized tissue. But apparently it wasn't enhancing the transport wasn't enough, in, wasn't enough to 
uh, achieve uniform and complete staining of mouse brain cell tissue because there is fundamental discrepancy between transport time scale and uh, target molecule and uh, probe reaction time scale, which is sub-second to minutes. So I will give you, I will show you an example uh, to illustrate why this uh, is a problem. So here we try to immunolabel whole mouse brain using histone antibody. And I'm just showing you guys the cross section of the tissue to better visualize the process. So the tissue is now immersed in uh, histone antibody solution and we are using uh, stochastic electrotransport to rapidly uh, deliver these charged antibodies. And they can actually penetrate deep into tissue within hours, but as soon as they uh, enter into the tissue and make a contact with target molecules, they immediately bind. So this is what you get after uh, stochastic electrotransport staining uh, of uh, this whole mouse brain. The out only outer layer is labeled, and you can see that the outer layer is really saturated, and there is no uh, signal from the middle of the tissue. And this is the entire view of the cross section. So to address this uh, issue, we developed another technology that we termed dynamic activity shift. So using this technique, we can dynamically modulate the reaction time scale of uh, molecular probes from like seconds to hours to match the reaction time, uh, the, the transport time scale. And we named the integrated approach of this technique uh, as E-Tango. So using E-Tango, we did a whole mouse um, histone staining, and this shows a ventral side of one hemisphere. This is 3D rendering. And now we are showing the optical cross section. And you can see uh, all the nucleus is very nicely labeled and the signal is very uniform uh, throughout this large size of tissue. So now within a day, we can achieve this uniform staining of um, mouse brain, but, uh, and also we can use this histone to obtain anatomical information, but it will be too costly if we use histone antibody for counter staining. So instead, we can use uh, organic dyes such as popro to uh, label nucleus. Um, so first, we tried passive staining of uh, one hemisphere of mouse brain. Um, and even though, and we found out that even though this chemical is really small, uh, in clear to process tissue, the penetration of this chemical, diffusion of this chemical is, uh, chemical is really slow. So after one day, uh, the penetration of this chemical uh, was only like 200 or 300 micron. And because, but because this chemical is charged, we can use stochastic electrotransport to enhance uh, uh, the del delivery, but the stochastic transport wasn't clearly not enough. So the transport, uh, the penetration that was a little bit better, but still uh, the core was completely like dark. We couldn't get any signal from the core. And if you use uh, dynamic activity shift alone, now we used uh, buffers to suppress the reactivity of this uh, nucleus dye. And now we uh, kind of reduce the saturated staining of the core, and you can see some staining in the middle, but it's not close to a complete and uniform staining. But if you combine uh, stochastic electrotransport with dynamic affinity shift, if you use this etango approach, you can uniformly and completely uh, stain the whole uh, hemisphere within a day and get anatomical information. And here is another example. Uh, so here we stained uh, GFP using anti-GFP antibody in uh, 
Psi 1 EJP mouse brain, whole mouse brain. And here I'm showing uh, this uh, cortex, uh, the hippocampus block. And JP signal is green, and N type JP signal is red. And as you can see, the overlay of these two signals is complete throughout the uh, whole layer. And achieving this level of uniform and complete staining is particularly challenging in this tissue because the density of these JP and uh, molecules are really high. So if you use passive staining, uh, you won't be able to achieve this level of uniform staining. And we also characterize the staining uh, efficiency throughout the whole brain and uh, be able to show that staining is uniform throughout the tissue, throughout the whole brain. Also, um, E-Tango is compatible with indirect immunostaining using, uh, that requires using primary and secondary antibodies. So here, uh, to demonstrate that we did pyrobalbumin staining in uh, Thai-1 EJP mouse brain. And this uh, shows a cortical region, piriform cortex. And as you zoom in, you can see uh, EJP expressing pyramidal neurons, projecting to a uh, subcortical layer. And it also express high level of pyrobalbumin proteins. So you, using you, this technique, you can get like morphological information and molecular information and uh, projection level information from the same tissue in a high super manner. And because uh, the staining is complete and uniform, we can do quantitative analysis. So here, uh, within this uh, block of the tissue, we were able to quantify how many neurons express uh, pyrobal, both pyrobalamin chip positive uh, GAP uh, in this brain region. And also, uh, this shows that we can get a very detailed subcellular resolution morphological in information. So this shows that these pyramidal neurons have uh, many dendrites, and many, many uh, dendritic spines. And uh, Itango is also compatible with uh, other types of uh, molecular probes. Uh, for example, shown here is carbohydrate binding protein, uh, lectin, which is widely used to visualize vasculature. So here we use lectin to label <coughs> vasculature in uh, one hemisphere of mouse brain. And as we zoom in, you can see the vasculature micro uh, vessels. It's quite amazing that it's everywhere and really dense. And you can see that the, the noise is very little and staining is very uniform. And we were able to achieve this uh, uniform staining within a day using E-Tango. So here is another example. We did uh, lectin and histone staining of, uh, whole, in whole mouse brain. And we imaged like four millimeter throughout uh, the hippocampus and cortical region. And you can see that the signal and the stain from both staining is very uniform throughout the uh, whole tissue. So uh, Itango is a new technique. It, it requires much uh, uh, improvement, but uh, using this technique now, we uh, can do, uh, we can uh, label large-scale 
like uh, human tissue within within uh, hours or days and address this molecular labeling problem. But there are many other problems that we need to overcome to make this technique really scalable for uh, maybe human brain. For example, uh, imaging this labeled tissue will take a while if you use a comfortable two photon microscopy. So we need to develop uh, high speed, high resolution imaging techniques. And also, uh, once we have these imaging techniques, we will get uh, petabyte data and processing this data and analyzing data analysis will be another big challenge. And also, human brain tissue has five times more lipids, so removing lipid uh, uh, and making tissue transparent is another big challenge. And uh, the big challenge actually that people, ha hasn't really, uh, people haven't really recognized is hydrogen formation. So uh, in animals, where um, that you can use cardiac perfusion to deliver all these chemicals, um, even though the, the tissue has this very intact uh, many lipid bilayers, you can quickly disperse these uh, hydrogen building, building blocks throughout the tissue uh, uniformly. But in postmortem human tissue, we cannot really deliver these chemicals uh, using damaged vasculature. So currently, we just immerse a postmortem human tissue in a solution that uh, contains all these chemicals. And during this process, these small chemicals like formaldehyde and these hydrogen monomers uh, can rapidly diffuse into these hydrophobic lipid bilayers uh, because they are not charged and small. Whereas this uh, initiator, thermal initiator, uh, because it's larger and it is charged, their diffusivity through this lipid bilayer is very, very slow. So, and also, this uh, thermal initiator is not stable. So you cannot uh, just uh, incubate tissue in this solution for many weeks. Like you can, the limitation is just a few weeks. And it's not enough, within a few weeks, this initiator can penetrate only like maybe one millimeter maximum. And without this initiator, we won't be able to form this nanoporous hydrogel inside the tissue. And without this hydrogel, we will lose all the structure and molecular information. So, uh, and then the tissue will become very fragile and, uh, and, and it, it, has, it doesn't have like low copy number key molecules. So here's one example, this is a human tissue, human brain tissue, two or three millimeter thick, and it's clear to process using normal clarity process. And when it is immersed in PBSD uh, supported by variancy, uh, it maintains its structure. But if it is half immersed in PBSD, it cannot even maintain its, uh, it, it cannot even withstand its uh, uh, weight of the tissue and it collapses. So it's another big challenge that we have to address. So we've been working hard to solve all these problems so that we can obtain uh, all this phenotypic information in a high school manner uh, to understand the interaction uh, between uh, genotype and environment. And I'd like to uh, finish my talk by acknowledging students working on developing clarity, Songyan, Eva Murray, Jaehun, and many other students in my lab and funding sources. Thank you for your attention. We have time for some questions and some volunteers are bringing around some microphones. Uh, have you ever tried this technology on uh, nerve innovating tissues like terminal organs such like skin or uh, intestine and what are the p uh, potential challenges to apply the entangle technology to look at the nerve terminals? Uh, we haven't tried this entangle technique uh, for other tissues but technically there is no limitation because the, any soft tissues uh, we can use this technique, like clarity. So 
Does this work equally well on brains of different ages? Uh, you mean like tissues? From animals. From mouse? Yeah. From mouse, yeah. Yeah, so here, like, uh, we used only adults. So it works equally well uh, on, like, any, any, any mouse brains with, from any age. But old mouse, it will take longer to clear, obviously, because it has more lipids. And it might be denser, but um, there is no fundamental limitations in applying this technique to uh, aged mouse brains. I have one question. Thank you for a uh, wonderful talk. Um, I was very impressed with the movie that you showed the, in relation between the pyramidal cells and the PV cells, you did the staining, and mm -hmm. it looked very sparse, the relationship between two cell types. And I want to find out if you are able to control the intensity of the staining, or it is the issue of the diffusion. Uh, I would have assumed that it would be much denser innervation by the PV cells in that movie. It didn't look that way. I see. So. Uh, because E-Tango enables all the cells inside the tissue to experience the same reaction condition, like uh, the binding time and antibody concentration, the, the, if you see uh, difference in a parvovirin signal, that, that is, I think, real. So some cells express high level of parvovirin, some cells express Low, uh, low level of parvovirin, but the density, we didn't do any control to kind of reduce the uh, labeling density. So I think it's just the way the brain is. Is that real? Yeah, that is real, yep, yep. But the GF, GFP uh, is expressing parvovirin neurons, it, it's only two to 5% in that brain region. So GFP labeling is very sparse. I'm wondering what is, if, if there's no limitation, what is the optimal size of the tissue that you would like to do the integral on? Because I would imagine that long-term electroporation could affect the antibody structure over time, or it, it hasn't been observed before. Uh, <clears throat> we haven't rigorously characterized, uh, studied if applying electric field damaged antibody structure uh, we haven't no noticed any uh, um, any damage, but and especially the the electric field that we apply is pretty weak, so I don't I don't see any issue there. In terms of size, now using this technique, we can stain a mouse brain size tissue, but if you want to stain a larger size tissue, then you need to think of like heat generate, if you apply electric field, it will generate true heating inside the tissue, then that could, or the heat could damage uh, antibodies. Uh, and processing smaller tissue than mouse brain size tissue is, is not a problem. So if possible, I would say processing like mouse brain size tissue is ideal. <laughs> 